We're going we're gonna to thank the panel because what they've done for you and for me today has been extraordinary. So if we could get a, a big round of applause for the panel. And if, if, we could, if we could run the video, and then I'll give a few words about our esteemed honoree, Joan Higginbotham. I'm NASA astronaut Joan Higginbotham. I uh, always loved math and science, and I love uh, kind of electronics. I used to always putz around with the different things that at home, much to my parents' chagrin. So I, I guess without knowing it, I really was kind of drawn, drawn to both of those subjects. My thing was just I wanted to become an electrical engineer and be just really good at my job and for people to think I was very competent. It was a fluke. <laughs> I actually was going to work for IBM after college. I worked for them for several summers and unfortunately they were not hiring engineers at the time. And uh, long story short is I got a call in my dorm room one night from a division chief here who had seen my resume and thought I would be a good match and offered me my choice of two positions in his uh, division. My biggest inspirations were my family members. I have an uh, incredible mom and dad and siblings who were very supportive and uh, they were always an inspiration to me because they always encouraged me to do my best. Probably my first sunrise, uh, I was up in the commander's seat. As a matter of fact, he had ordered me to come to the flight deck because my head had been in space half for you know, a day and a half and told me to sit down and look out the window. And it was just the beginning of a sunrise. And you could just see the uh, curvature of the earth and then you could see the sun just bursting forth. And it was just, it was a beautiful sight. I, I, uh, I was just enamored for a very long time. It was probably one of my tensest moments when I was up there because you have this huge piece of equipment on this 70 foot long arm and it's worth billions of dollars. And the only thing you're thinking in, in, my, in your mind is don't let me hit anything. And uh, when we didn't have a payload on the end of it, we actually had one of the crew members. And, and again, you have a precious life on the end of the arm. So you're just tense the entire time and just very, very focused about what you're doing. best aspect is probably getting to meet a lot of different people and getting to go a lot of different places. Um, I've met incredible people not only in the astronaut corps but just all over the world and that's probably one of the neatest things we get to do. I think everybody sees it as this great big, like uh, Disney World ride for us and it's this wonderful vacation and they for really for, uh, tend to forget that we are actually working really hard. I mean, from the time we get up there and unstrap to the time we come back, we are just moving at a pretty good clip. Shop. <laughs> Shop, uh, work out, hang out with my girlfriends, uh, try to spend time uh, with my family as much as possible. Just do very human, very normal things. No, I've been in this career for 20 years now, and it's pretty much been the only career I've been in. Uh, short of becoming the NFL commissioner, I'm not really sure what other uh, pathway I would take for my career. Well, if Joan Higginbotham wanted to be the NFL commissioner, she would be the NFL commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt in the world. She would 
She could be whatever she wants to be. This is a story that is beyond extraordinary. Uh, Joan Higginbotham, a retired NASA astronaut who has logged over 300 hours in space and had a chance to go back into space, but had an opportunity to take a job with Marathon Oil and in 2007 decided to do that. Last night we were at a dinner and I must have had two dozen people come up to me before they left, they said, I don't know about you, but I have to go meet an astronaut. I have to go meet an astronaut right now. So excuse me, I'm going to meet an astronaut. It's, it's just one of those things we are fascinated by people who have been to frontiers that we could only imagine. And Joan Higginbotham is carrying on a wonderful legacy. She's getting today's Leadership and Inspiration Award but if you think about what she's doing in the community now, she's working as a director of community affairs for Lowe's companies. So not only is she a role model because of who she is, but she's actively working to help people. So I'd like to bring Joan up and perhaps she can say a few words and we're honoring her with the Dedication to Community Award for leadership and inspiration. Joan? Thank you, I look so young. <laughs> Good afternoon, um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I have to say that I had not been exposed to the organization D2C prior to Quentin calling me so like any good honoree, I did my research on the organization. But if you've ever done research on anything, you know that you can only get the, the book knowledge of it. It's different between book knowledge and actually experiencing, experiencing it. And so between last night and today, I've got to experience it. And I have to say that this is a truly powerful, dynamic organization. And I'm glad, thank you, Quentin, for inviting me here today. Uh, regardless of whether or not I was getting a, an award, this has been a really re rewarding experience, enriching experience for me. And it's very interesting listening to all the panelists because there are similarities, I think, in, in everyone's story. And there are things that you can take away no matter what you've achieved in life, there's always something you can learn from somebody. So I actually got some, some nuggets from just about every speaker up here, so thank you for that. Um, and I would love to think that I am truly deserving of this award, but I know there are so many inspiring uh, leaders in the Charlotte area and all over, and so to be even considered for this, I am truly grateful that, for th so thank you very much. Just wanna share um, a little bit about my story. People are like, I'm really dying to hear you speak. I said, I'm not really not speaking, I'm just gonna say thank you. Um, but I, I will just share briefly kind of how I got to where I was. Um, I learned last night that Ronaldo is my homie. He's from uh, the south side of Chicago. Um, so that six degrees of separation is probably 0.5 degrees of separation. <laughs> At least with Q. <laughs> <laughs> At least with Q, that's right. He seems to be the, the cog and everything is jutting out from him. So there, there are a lot of um, uh, small degrees of separation here. Um, but I grew up in Chicago, south side. My mom too was a teacher. Um, so she was not having any stupid children. Uh, and so she made a study and study and study. And uh, I, I was a pretty good student too and I loved math and science like I said in the video. And uh, I became a budding engineer when I took my brother's transistor radio. I know there's some of you in the audience that have no idea what a transistor radio is. <laughs> but I took my brother's brand new transistor radio that he got for his birthday. I opened the back of it. I saw all the pretty wires and I cut them and I reattached them back differently and uh, wondered why it didn't work. He wondered why it didn't work. I knew why it didn't work. <laughs> so he was not too amused that he was my muse for becoming an engineer. 
Um, I got corralled into a program that uh, was inroads. I, I think they still have some chapters in some cities that is a program geared to uh, women and minorities to get us into the engineering field. I went into electrical engineering. Dr. Roll, I did not become a Kim E because I saw those folks up at midnight in their dorm rooms playing with the orgo molecules. I was like, <laughs> I'm never taking organic chemistry. So that, that took out uh, chemical engineering for me. I was like, electrical engineering because those wires, I can do that. Um, and I worked for IBM for a couple of summers. I was going to work for them. Uh, they were not hiring. And uh, this was 1987, a year after Challenger. And I got a call in my dorm room one night from a gentleman who said he saw my resume and thought I'd be a fabulous fit in his organization. And I'm thinking, NASA who? I didn't know anything about NASA besides Challenger. And obviously, that wasn't a plus in their column. Um, and um, the other job offer I did have was going to offer me $5,000 more than NASA, so another not plus in the column. Um, but they, t they did something really phenomenal. They flew me down for an interview in Florida. I left Chicago. It was rainy. It was gray. I landed in Orlando. There were palm trees on the runway. It was 80 degrees. And I figured, even if I don't work for NASA, I'm moving to Florida. <laughs> so I went to Florida, went to the Space Center. I saw the Space Shuttle and the Space Launch Pad. And I'm like, holy moly. It looked like something out of Star Wars. And I figured I'd give it 25 years. So 20 years later, I'm still there. But in the interim, several things happened. I got to be a rocket scientist. I launched 57 uh, shuttles successfully up and back. I got to see these really cool astronauts that would come down in their blue suits. They'd be like 10 feet tall and so cool. I mean, who isn't cool? Astronauts are so cool. And uh, you know, so I, I, was, I was happy launching shuttles and, and working with astronauts. And then one day, I had a director who said something to me that changed my life forever. And again, this is something people seeing something in you that you may not see in yourself. And he said, you'd make a great astronaut. And while I was flattered, I figured it was like one of those things when you see people and you're like, hey, how are you doing today? And you're like, I don't really care. I'm just being a pleasantry. So I thought that was a pleasantry that he was saying to me. But he kept asking me had I applied. And I finally applied so that he wouldn't ask me again. And lo and behold, I got an interview. So 6,000 people applied to be an astronaut. 122 people got interviews. So that pool went from this to this. Long story short, we waited six months. We went through interviews. I did not get selected. Then I was torqued. I was like, what do you mean I can't be an astronaut? I don't like people telling me no. It didn't matter that I really didn't want to be one when I started one in the first place. I just, I don't like being told no. And it was actually kind of cool when I went through the process. I was like, well, maybe this can happen. Because when my boss originally said, you make a great astronaut, I didn't really think that I had what it took. I was doubting myself. And so after um, I was not um, accepted, I asked what the problem was, what I can do to make, be a better candidate. They told me more education. I didn't want to hear that because I had just literally just completed my, my master's degree about four months earlier, and I thought I was done. So I had something to think about. I decided that I wanted to give this another shot. I got another master's degree, and long story short, I got accepted the, the next time around. So during that process, I learned a couple of things, and I just want to share a few with you. The first one, as I said, it's amazing what people may see in you that you don't see in yourself. Um, so always surround yourself with good people, as our, our panel told us here, because you need those people who are going to lift you up when you're down, but you're also going to need those people to give you a swift kick in the pants when you need one. That's what a true friend does. The other thing is that in life, you're going to be presented with some pretty amazing opportunities. You should always be poised to take, um, to take advantage of those. And the last thing is that we were always told to have a career plan. And I did have a career plan. Mine was going to be to work at IBM. But sometimes when that doesn't pan out, you should always have a backup. And you should be always ready to take advantage of those different opportunities that come your way. So I was always told that the sky is the limit, and I just have to absolutely disagree with that because I think everybody on this panel has gone way and above the sky. I mean, they are stellar in their professions. And I definitely have literally been beyond the sky, so I can tell you that the sky is no longer the limit. So if I had one message for all the students who are here today, it is to aim high and dream big 
because there's absolutely nothing that you can't accomplish if you put your mind to it. So thank you very much.